The last three years of war have shown no mercy to either side. The bitter fighting continues across Europe over land, sea, and air, leaving behind mountains of casualties and many more broken souls. The United States till now had remained neutral, but the mounting economic pressure and the return of Germany to unrestricted submarine warfare finally awakes the sleeping giant. On April 6, 1917, the United States declares war on Germany. Within months of the declaration, the U.S. Army launched the first Universal Draft. And despite enduring segregation in their own country, over 360,000 African Americans enlist, eager to show their patriotism in hopes of returning home as heroes. James is one of these men. Dear Brother James, I hope this letter finds you well and that working at the docks is not too backbreaking. It's good to receive news from you and from home. Keeps my mind off of the war. We wallow in the trenches, in the mud among the rats and the dead bodies, afraid that if we stand tall, we might catch a bullet. But if you take anything from my letter, I want it to be this. Do whatever you can to stay away from this madness. You followed me everywhere when we were kids. But please, don't follow me here, James. There is nothing here but misery and death. Be safe and stay home. Freddy. Very no! <laughs> Dear Freddy, it's good to hear from you. Sorry to disappoint, but it looks like I'm following you around again. I've already enlisted with the 15th New York National Guard Regiment, or the old 15th, as they call us. We're done with our training and on our way to the front. We'll sail from New York to France. We're on our way to help you win the war. But don't you worry about me. I can take care of myself just fine. Your little brother, James. April 9th, 1917, Vimy Ridge. This geographic stronghold held by the Germans since the early days of the war remained impenetrable. In the latest attempt to break through the German defenses, ground forces were ordered to team up with the British Royal Flying Corps. Before launching the attack, the soldiers were given a moment to write to their loved ones. Aim! Interrupted by George's unconventional landing, Freddy soon learned that his unit was going to take part in the operation and be paired up with the peculiar British pilot, now grounded and without a plane to fly. Ten hot hole! Ready? Despite his haphazard flying, George managed to pinpoint the enemy's location. He relayed the information to Freddy, who then launched the strike on the enemy cannons. 
But despite the triumph of reclaiming Vimy Ridge after three long years, their victory was marred by the dead bodies strewn across the hillside. While Europe was torn apart by war, the U.S. had begun a massive mobilization in what many believed could permanently change the tide of the war. Aboard the USS Pocahontas was a racially segregated unit, the Old 15th, made up almost entirely of African-American soldiers. These men were sailing to Europe, ready to put their lives on the line to prove their love for a country that didn't always love them back. Dear Freddy, we're on our way to France. This is our first night at sea, but don't worry, me and the boys are ready. Speaking of the fellas, I lucked out and I'm getting on good with a fine bunch of them. There's Fidgety Lang Edwards, who never puts down his drumsticks. Jack Harris, our medic from Chicago. Joey Brass is from Harlem and plays a mean banjo. And Chef Caldwell is always cooking up stuff for us. We just have to make sure to get served before B.B. Johnson. A <laughs> great guy, but he can really put it away. Well, I gotta go now. Practice is about to start, and there's no jazz band without a clarinet. <laughs> Stay safe. We'll see each other soon. Your brother, James. As the Pocahontas continued to cross the Atlantic, their encounter with the German U-boat 155 brought them ever closer to the fight. Entering the battlegrounds of the war, their ship was spotted by Ernst. May 31st, 1916. On land, the conflict was bogged down in trench warfare. Neither the Allies nor the Central Powers were able to make significant gains. At sea, Allied forces dominated Germany with a crippling blockade. Determined to stay away from the war, Ernst escaped to the solitude offered by the depths of the sea. It was here below the surface that he scavenged, hoping to eke out a living. As his boat settled on the seabed, Ernst began to come to terms with the war's inevitable, all-consuming power. Defeated and alone, he could feel the Jutland water's cold embrace tightening around him. Stranded for hours in the aftermath of the Battle of Jutland, Ernst was starting to feel his grip slip away. But when the merchant sailors aboard the submarine, the Germania, came to his aid, they not only saved Ernst's life, 
they also took him in as one of their own. In them, Ernst found kindred spirits and instantly felt right at home. But even at home, you have to carry your weight. Schnapps 1916, the U.S. had remained neutral, allowing for business as usual. Despite trade blockades, the few merchant submersibles in existence, like the Germania, were still able to trade with them. James, who was working the Baltimore docks at the time, was surprised to see the submarine pull into port. Fight. Hey. Huh? No! <sighs> <sighs> Hi, James. Here you go. New guys. Clarinet. Ah, clarinet. All us click. Holiday Musica. Yes. Dear Freddy, I'm glad to hear you're doing good. I hope you won't be upset with me what with the war and all, but I recently met a German, and we really had a lot in common. It turns out Ernst is a damn good musician. I'm proud to say he's become a friend. We promised each other that when this war is over, me and Ernst will play together again. I intend to keep that promise. Your brother, James. The Germania's voyage was a commercial success, and her crew returned eager for their next trade. But their triumphant return was interrupted by the German Imperial Navy. As the sole German national aboard, Ernst was conscripted to fight. The submarine, too. decree of the Kaiser, the Germania was henceforth ordered to hunt convoys in the Atlantic. Ernst was faced with a grim choice, yes. torpedo the Pocahontas and kill his friend, or disobey a superior's direct order and risk being put to death. He had chosen to save his friend, but knew it would only be a matter of time before he was ordered to kill again. Nineteen seventeen, Saint Manihold Hospital. Doctors and nurses alike tried in earnest to patch up swarms of broken bodies and wounded psyches. Anna, the Belgian nurse, battled every day against the war to save soldiers. 
Sometimes Anna could heal the soldiers' ailments and put them on the path to recovery. Other times, it was a matter of alleviating their pain and merely postponing the inevitable. On this day, a rare ray of hope pierced the gloom of the hospital grounds. Finally, with the arrival of new medical equipment, technological progress would be used to help the wounded of war instead of producing them. Surprised to see her dear friend again, Anna handled each of the wounded soldiers with care. She couldn't wait to speak with Freddy and catch up on old times. Reunited, Anna and Freddy both took solace in the bonds of friendship. Hearing the bombs fall, Anna knew they had struck the heart of a populated civilian area. Always quick to act, she drove off to help the wounded. Zeppelin creep toward the bombed factory. Freddy feared the worst for Anna. He hopped on his motorbike and raced to join her. <laughs> Freddy arrived just in time to see Anna emerging from the debris. She had once again put her life on the line to save others. December 27th, 1917. The Pocahontas arrived in Brest, France to a celebratory welcome. Unknown to the old 15th, the decision had already been made to use them only for combat service support. They were not to see battle. Desperate for soldiers to fight, the French pushed hard for the newly arrived 15th to join them on the battlefield. They were eventually successful. The old 15th would fight under the French banner and be renamed the 369th Infantry Regiment. The Americans were once again outfitted as soldiers should be, then paired up with a French counterpart. They would now all fight together. Freddy? Huh? You know Freddy? Yeah. For James and Freddy, the long-awaited reunion was a powerful reminder that neither time nor distance can erode the extraordinary bond of brotherhood. The general mood among the 369th Infantry was one of camaraderie and shared purpose. Anna, joining them for a last meal before heading back to Vimy, was finding it particularly hard to say goodbye to Freddy. 
But their renewed optimism was soon dashed. By nightfall, everyone in the 369th would be reminded of the perils this war had in store for them. Arriving in Vimy, Anna was now ready to begin her new assignment, training British medics. Meanwhile, George was developing photos taken during his reconnaissance missions. But tonight, the quiet peace of the dark room was broken by a barking Walt. As George headed back toward Allied lines, he snapped a photo of the massive movement of enemy troops and weapons. Upon landing, George was placed under arrest on suspicion of espionage. Fortunately, he was able to back up his story with proof. Spring 1918, with the Brest-Litovsk peace treaty signed, German fighting on the Eastern Front came to an end, freeing up troops for advancement to the Western Front. A series of offensives were launched, pushing the Allied lines to the breaking point. The last of these offensives was launched near saint menehould For James and the 369th, the long-awaited opportunity to prove themselves had finally come. Even though they had managed to hold the position, the 369th had paid a heavy price. Before leaving to care for the wounded, Anna made sure to give James and Freddy a long embrace, hoping this would not be their last. After a dreadful night fighting to stay alive, James and Freddy were blinded by the camera flash. Impressed by the troops' accomplishments, the American press gave them the nickname Harlem Hellfighters. Their brand of music was all the rage, earning them an invitation to perform in Paris.
August 8th, 1918. On land, Germany endured its darkest day of war. Knowing the Kaiser's demand for victory was unattainable, the German officers pressed forward, fighting for more advantageous positions at sea in the hope of gaining leverage for negotiating a truce. Following a series of revolts by their troops, German command ordered naval captains to tighten their grip on sailors and quash any stirrings of mutiny at sea. Hearing about acts of insurrection, Ernst felt emboldened and decided he had to deactivate his submarine's torpedoes. While Ernst was happy to be alive, he again found himself in the crossfire of war and his freedom taken away. Now a British POW, his only consolation was being able to play his fiddle once more. September 26, 1918. Determined to cut the German supply line, Allied forces launched the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. For James and his fellow soldiers, this undertaking was bigger than any they had faced before. Soldiers on both sides steeled themselves for the whistle blow and the impending chaos of the charge. Their sole comfort being the unwavering support of their brothers in arms. Freddy, barely able to get the words out, pleaded with James to lead the men and continue their push forward with the offensive. Reluctant to leave him behind, James complied. No! <laughs> Flying in such stormy weather would have been a challenge for any skilled pilot. Even so, George had decided to brave the storm and risk his own life to save his friends. <laughs> Stunned no. to see her dear Freddy suffering, Anna quickly got to work. After four long years, Freddy's injuries had ended his fight. Always the one to protect others, he would now be the one in need of care on the slow road to recovery. Despite his wounds, he remained in good spirits thanks to Anna by his side every step of the way. With Freddy out of commission, James took over as squad leader. For the Harlem Hellfighters, the experience on the ground remained brutal, and the memory of their fallen friends ever present. Hold on, Metro! 
At that very moment, news of the truce being signed between the German and Allied forces made its way to the front. Anna was sent to relay the good news without delay. And just like that, at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, the war suddenly stopped. Bells rang all over the country spreading the good news. The war was finally over. Seeking a new life far from the devastation of Europe, Anna and Freddie set off to make a home in the United States. Pending the outcome of the Treaty of Versailles, Ernst was still being held captive in France as a POW, forced to do hard labor. Thanks to George's flying and active valor, the RAF accepted him as one of their own. After being duly rewarded the Croix de Guerre by the French military, the Harlem Hellfighters were once again placed under American command. And while the Harlem Hellfighters prepared to return home, James and Lang Edwards volunteered to help the Service of Supply clean up the battlefield. Huh? Ernst? Ernst! Ah, uh. oh, James! Huh? <sighs> Yes, sir. Dear James, I'm not sure where or when this message will find you, but please know that I've made every effort to contact you. The day had started so well. We were on our way to buy furniture for our home. When some men told us we couldn't shop together. Freddy argued with them. Menagama! And it ended badly. Uh. Freddy! Hold on, Freddy. No! I couldn't save him. No, no, no. Freddy! I'm including the letter he intended to mail you. I'm sorry to share this horrible news. Your friend, Anna. Dear James, I hope you're doing fine. I can't wait for you to come back home, and I bet you're feeling the same way. I'm sure you're keeping everyone in good cheer with those sweet melodies you play on your clarinet. I never imagined romance would come back into my life, especially during a war. But Anna and I are both enjoying a fresh start. 
None of this would have been possible without you. Your optimism and infectious spirit brought me back to life. It's also been such a joy to see you mature into the man you've become today. I'm so incredibly proud of you. With all that you've accomplished, I know now there are better days for us, for people who look like you and me. I'm certain that the future you and so many others fought for will become a reality. P.S. I hear there's going to be a parade in honor of those who served during the war. You should be home by then, and I will be right by your side. <laughs> See you soon, little brother. Freddy. Despite heroic efforts during the First World War, it would take nearly a century for the Harlem Hellfighters to finally get the recognition that they earned with their lives, their dignity, and their valiant hearts. And like so many other people dragged into this war on all sides, we should honor both the remembered and the forgotten, whose lives were indelibly altered ruined and far too often lost in the machine.